welcome to the show. Thank you, Darren. I'm so glad to be here. No, same, same. This is a, a special show for us. We we came together as a community in the time of, of COVID and as spring is upon us, as more and more people are getting vaccines, if they choose to get vaccines, people are starting to go out more and I'm starting to feel that energy. Yeah. And, um, it's nice to have a conversation with someone who I know I can maybe meet one day. You know, usually the, the earlier sessions were like, we'll meet one day. Now I'm like, we're, we're getting there. So welcome to the show. Where are you sitting and how did you make it through last year? That's how we always like to start because this mm-hmm. shows so much about that empathy and just that, how did you like get yourself out of bed every day? So then we'll get into some data conversations, but where are you sitting and how did you make it through last year? Okay, so I'm in Chicago. I know you're in Florida. You're in yes. Florida. Yeah, you're warm. I'm still not warm. It's still cold here. It's a little. It's a little nutty. Yeah. Uh, my trees don't get the memo. They're all budding up, but I am actually cold. So just really quickly, I would like to say that I am hearing disabled. So if I ask you to repeat. Uh, I am very good at reading lips. It's not, I was not born hearing disabled. It just happened one day, they're neurosensorial hearing disabilities. So just as a little bit of uh, an FYI, but that also helps me answer the COVID question because uh, one day out of the blue, I just had all this hearing disabilities seven years ago and I couldn't hear the voices of my children anymore. So like I, for example, meeting you, I get so many cues of your body language, of your face, the kindness of your smile. And I make a composite of what I think your voice sounds like. There's so much identity in a voice, right? But I think that overcoming shock, traumatic, you know, earthquake type seismic moves in previously in life, in your biography also helps you find that drive to overcome new seismic movements, even though things may not be easy. Because of business, I do have an exposure to Asia Pacific. So I was pretty early on this COVID thing. I was sending my husband out in the L with a mask in February way before it started. But we, even though we were very careful and I'm a high risk patient, I have really um, a lot of lung conditions because of asthma. So we had already talked to my doctors and we were very well set up here at home to overcome COVID because at the time the doctors were like, we don't want you in a ventilator, you will not make it. But we also got COVID. We got COVID really early on. So, and I became a long hauler. I'm the only person in my family who is a long hauler. I have two teenagers and a husband and myself. And let me tell you, it was because I knew what was coming so early on. I, in a way, I was cognitively scaffolded to what was going to happen. Uh, secondly, I'm not trying to be Dr. Doom, but I had been very vocal in my family about all these things and in network theory, right? How the cascading effects, and I'm also a big chaotician as well in mathematics. I use chaos theory a lot. So how things that may seem so mundane and small can have really big ramifications uh, at large levels that then now you put on top of that the interoperability of our lives, all the systems coming together, and it's a big problem. So, you know, COVID hit, we got all sick. I needed oxygen for five days. My daughter needed oxygen for one day. In the middle of all of this, I um, was writing an article uh, about AI and COVID. And I really wanted to publish it. And I'm, you know, with oxygen and trying to do something good. I think that for me, despite of how hard it was to recover, and I'm still recovering, I have ended up in the hospital three times, hospitalized because of long hauler symptoms. For me, I think because 
my neurological system is my weak spot. COVID really, really hit me uh, in, at a neurological level. So I've had issues getting back to work out, uh, regaining strength, severe migraines. I mean, my team can tell you there have been months that I have been working in the dark because the light was just too much. Also, I have gotten a lot of neurological corruption in the signals from my gastric system. So uh, I have gone to the ER. They thought it was peritonitis. It wasn't. It, is, it has been quite has been quite challenging. And I have been living with this level of pain, um, unfortunately, you know, from there's nothing that can be done. I was going to be putting on immunosuppressant therapy to try to maybe disrupt the signals that the body is saying, oops, it must be COVID again, but it's not, right? Um, but, you know, because of everything that is happening with the new variants and all of that, ooh, I decided to maybe put a hold on that. I was, was going to say, thank you for sharing that story. There is a lot there that you went through. The audience that's going to watch this on YouTube, you would never notice it. She is calm and cool, calm and cool. You would never feel chaos or pain. It's inspiring because your body language is someone whose shoulders are back and not complaining about the awful year that you had with that. So thank you for sharing that. So now as a data person that went through this, where are you? This is a riff. So where are you with the china technology of everything is on the cell phone we're going to do contact tracing on the the phone we're going to tell you where you were where you weren't so where are you with privacy i know is that the right word privacy or cell phone to cell phone in the us with being able to contact trace because we have the tech to know where you were who was there who was close to you? Where are you just looking back on it with that data privacy on cell phones? That's a really good question, Darren. And um, also it connects to how, you know, I got through last year in a way. So I have been in this office. I've been working, uh, you know, from my home for years. I was never disrupted. As you know, we have several corporations in data science and in the cloud. But the big thing, I think, for me, when I went on to found Data Innovation Labs and is creating a new environment for data scientists to really work in interoperability and in applied data science within specific domain knowledges. And there's a couple things as a data scientist that we don't have in the industry. There is a lot of discontent in, it's great, you get this great data science job, but then your creativity starts going away. You get, you are given a big problem, you solve it, but then you get stuck in it. You are just another cog in the wheel. There's where, and we are by definition, because it's an intersection science. So by definition, data science um, must always keep in mind that you need to do other research. You need to think about other problems to keep on being productive in the ones that you're currently solving. In DIL, we have that, but it was a mission. It was a mission that I wanted to change that. Another thing is that I graduated from Harvard in data science um, and in computer science. I specialized in data science. And it was awful to see friends that couldn't get a job because the interview is a software engineering interview that has been sprinkled some data science. And there's still a lot in the industry to change to how do you properly vet a data scientist? Do you need to do extra training? Do you know what data science is as a corporation? The other thing that, and this is going to touch straight into that point, the other thing that I really wanted to make sure that I built um, an industry standard in DIL and we're so successful, we're, we're so lucky to have such an amazing data science team, it is ethics. Ethics is long forgotten. It's not just about 
taking a class in ethics or intersecting? Maybe I should ask this question. Um, I always say there's a reason why math comes out of philosophy. You should really think where you should put that plus sign. I mean, think about it. I know you're laughing, but people don't think about it. They just put the formula there and they don't give it a second thought. That shouldn't happen. It should not happen. We, and also with privilege comes responsibility. As data scientists, we're so privileged, not only by the ability of our intellect, but by the ability of our curiosity. So you should embrace the whole spectrum of ethics and think about doing the right thing. Think about doing the right thing in your models. Think about making sure that are you considering negative externalities? Can this, are you really cross-validating properly? Are you actually increasing biases because you didn't take this step well or you didn't go further on this step or because the infrastructures that you're running these models that's the reason why Petitera exists, because of our data science needs. The reason that you're running these models and you have to do a heuristic cross-validation so you can actually not, you know, overfit your model. Uh, you cannot really do it properly because it's going to cost you $100,000 just with the combinatronics of the hyperparameters to cross-validate. A lot of times, as data scientists, we are put in a position where we have to shortchange our methods because of budget or because of directive. And I wanted to make sure that we really built proper industry standards. That is also how we look at ethics in our work. How we look at ethics in, within ourselves is not just human to human. It is the overall concept of ethics. It, there shouldn't be a climate ethics, a human ethics. You should just think about it in generalities to really do good work the point is doing good, motivating work. And also data. What does data mean? We have gone beyond this idea that a number is a data. If I can analyze it, it's data. And that is sound, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a picture, it's a video. The idea of data is different and we should all embrace it. It's not a categorical variable, an ordinal variable. You see what I'm saying? A, a quantitative variable. Data's definition now are given by the powers of our technologies. If we can analyze it, believe it or not, is data. Furthermore, data is a digital asset. I'm really working with certain governments that I will not mention, but I am working with certain governments to take the position that are more avant-garde into, you know, digital economies, to take the position that data actually is a digital asset. It holds value. It has tons of value. You transact it. Um, you transact it for something, right? I mean, we give up certain privacy of our data if we want certain app for free, for example. So one of the things that kept me going through 2020 was keeping these big missions, right? Thinking about these bigger problems. And despite of COVID, I have rambled through it and I have led these teams of people to keep on thinking about these big missions. And that has meant helping my teams through deaths in their family due to COVID. Uh, it has been helping my team with personal and mental health issues that may arise. But then you move to how to leverage technology. Um, I think that, you know, the things that happen in China <laughs> happen in China. There is a different level of governance. There is a different level of acceptance as to what considers your privacy and what is in the good of the of the overall. In the West, we do have a different perspective. In the well, in the West, we have an idea of our own personal journey. We are more dissected away from the neighbor, but COVID has stress tested a lot of systems. It has tested infrastructure. It has tested technical infrastructure, the cloud. 
It has stress tested human systems. It has stress tested supply chains. I mean, we are now exposed a lot more to the flickering of, you know, of the backlit screens in the computer. How is that affecting your frontal lobes? Is that creating, if you have a certain predispositions to develop something, is that actually affecting you? Um, the mental health issue needs to be brought more to the table because we are not evolutionary designed to be in this, with this level of charge of digital technology. In regards to, you know, the mobile app tracking or tracking per se, we don't do a very good job necessarily in this country uh, regarding traceability, regarding tracing. And you can actually see it in this entire new vaccine and not getting political, but in this entire new vaccine topic, right? Johnson and Johnson get put, puts on a pause. The CDC says, well, one in a million cases. And that has been repeated a lot over the news. Uh, they're doing their job. This, that's what the CDC should be doing. Also, what is not permeating the news here, and very few people are talking about it, is that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine that has wide distribution in Europe are on the same platform. In Europe, the same problems are happening. However, it's one in a hundred thousand. So you go to ask yourself, we're not really that much different from Europe. So is that a is that a data collection issue? Do we are we really having that systemic problems at a health level that we're not collecting enough data, which is extremely valuable for the vaccine distribution because vaccine production is very difficult and the human leap that we took with the development of these vaccines was amazing. But the vaccine trajectory, what makes a vaccine good from day zero until it's deployed is also in the time series tracking of that vaccine. We don't have that because we can't wait until, you know, 15 years to track a certain population to know if anything is going to happen neurologically to you 10 years down the road or you're going to develop, I don't know, some soft tissue cancer, which, you know, things like that. So this this what, what is happening right now, it is what should happen, but also that permeates the problem of data collection data traceability, information tracking. Are you actually, are people actually displaying in this country cognitive biases of not actually sharing the right information with the providers? Is this a systemic healthcare issue? Are we not really having doctors properly categorize a complaint that a patient brings? Um, on that realm, Traceability via mobile with proper governance, I'm not talking China level governance, but I'm talking with a proper governance, uh, would help solve some of the problems, right? right? I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm going to, there's a, there's a lot there. Yes, and, there is. And what's, what's interesting about this is I, I mentor college students. Mm -hmm. And one of the college Me students I one of the college students I, I mentor is a Stanford grad, and she is from Wuhan, China. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! And she said she lives, grew up in Wuhan, a town that nobody ever heard of. Now everyone knows Wuhan, and she talks about how beautiful the town is and the culture and the food and what that town now symbolizes globally. And we talk about the data privacy and, and data. And she showed me how they were doing it on the mobile because her family is still there. So she walked me through how in May, June, July, August of last year, when you in, live in a state where you can be shut down in a good way, quarantine in a way you don't go out. I thought it was an interesting, I thought it was an interesting as a data point of view, because we've always talked about how China might be coming ahead of us because there is no privacy in China. They're going to be ahead of us in AI. They're going to be ahead of us in all this technology because there is no privacy cameras everywhere. But that seems something like too big of a concept. 
But again, when it comes to contact tracing and knowing where your phone is, I think you're right. We will not have that type of transparency. We're not going to be able to share at that level. And I don't know if it's right or wrong, but we don't, we do know it's captured somewhere. We know that the phones know where we are. We know the phone companies know where we are, but we're just not sharing enough. Well, this is also the other problem is that what is the governance of that data, right? It's right. your data. You should be able to make decisions with that, not your cell phone carrier provider. Um, you know, I know it's a revolutionary concept. Uh -huh. I know. And that's what worries me about data and us as a superpower in the next few years. We don't Let me have tell you, this data. is one of the reasons why we did clean. Clean uh, from our company. Clean is DIL's response to COVID to reopen economies because we're not tracing in clean. We are it's spelled is 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 like cute, you know how we all are like with our cute cats and things like that. So it's K L E the long E N. So the phonetic clean spelling. And I was able to trademark it. So, but that was one of the reasons why we did clean because there were a couple of information asymmetries. Information asymmetries are not even in the times of COVID. Consumers have a very different information asymmetry than the business do. Regulations are constantly changing. Things are coming from the CDC. Then you get slap a level of governance in your city or in a specific area. Then as consumers, your information is pretty much given by the news. And right, I mean, let's be honest, and you don't really know. There's also the information asymmetry of all the guidelines that businesses have to try to do because in the United States, for example, in the case of British Columbia, Canada, and here, the CDC guidelines of British Columbia are much more imperative as a business. You must do this. You must do that. Here in the US, the CDC guidelines are more encouraging. They're a little bit more vague, but they're like, it is beneficial if you do this. We would suggest you do the, you do the following. But there's a lot of things that happen in a business that businesses are doing and they're destining a lot of resources to do that you don't see as a consumer. You are not exposed to it because it's happening after you left the store or after you left the restaurant. So there were a couple of, of disinformation asymmetries in this new environment of COVID that needed to happen and get solved for all of us to get back out and economies to reopen. And that is part, it touches upon what you're saying about the philosophy of governance and data in which in the West, we are not designed to endogenously think about the aggregate. However, with COVID, in the world of COVID, you must think about your neighbor, you must. So that empathy needs to go beyond and take responsibility of your actions towards your neighbor. So that's one point. But there is no platform that allows you to do that. And I'm not going to mention names, but in reviews of restaurants, those platforms, it's the consumer's position on a restaurant, but it's not the restaurant input on what the consumers are saying. There's very little governance of the feedback and the impact that that get, gives me as a business just by being listed in this rating sites. So really, we needed a lot of changes, and that is why we created Clean. We created Clean so we would aggregate all these guidelines. We actually have worked in RegTech in the in DIL as well. So we took that work, we parsed it as part. It's super complicated logic, by the way, because it's a lot of million different things. So we took all these guidelines everywhere and gave them parsed properly for the area where you're at. 
Secondly, it actually tells the consumers when you're cleaning, when was the last time you clean? It becomes a communication and a trust tool among communities. So you as a consumer, you have your cleanup and you can see your favorite places and you can actually say, oh, okay, I need a mask. Oh, okay, they changed the hours of operation. I should go at this time. Um, we needed something that was AI for good. And what does that mean? It means doing the right thing at the right time. And at DIL, we tried to do something else as well. Originally, I was actually trying to get data from China <laughs> to kind of replicate a similar technology on diagnostics of AI. Mind you, I was COVID at the time, but I was still working through it. And, um, you know, because there's a lot of uh, CT scan diagnostics that you can do with COVID with vision computing for us wouldn't have been a problem. And we were trying to reach out to, you know, the, the state of yeah. New York to do that. Mm -hmm. And because of we couldn't get actually the data out of China because China closed all the research data uh, out outlets, we could have as DIL, we could have gone and said, you know, we tried, we, we tried to do the right thing, but we didn't. And that's why we created clean. So no, I clean. love it. And because the reason is, there's a few people in our in our community that are in hospitals and healthcare. And there are going to be a few people on LinkedIn I'm going to start connecting you with because I think there are some intros and things that we can help you and clean because I think what you're doing is meaningful. And we have a strong community that's built on empathy. And there are some people I'd like you to meet because I think you are impressive and what a story, but also what you're working on matters. So um, if that's okay with you, I want to have you back on the data standard. Oh, and make some interest. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we can talk about specific. Yes, we. Yep. There's a lot to unpack in yep. some of these portions that I said. But yeah, yes, no, I, I would sure. love to be on on your show again. Um, additionally, we at DIL to promote creativity among our data scientists. We have a research department. We are currently also working on mental health and AI. Right. There's a huge gap. There's also a huge gap on teenagers. Well, I, I think um, we're going to have you back talking about all that. Let's keep some for the next show. <laughs> yes, but we time. welcome we welcome collaboration. Thank you. Well, we're going to have you back. Thank you. All so right. impressive. Thank okay. you, Thank you Darren. Well. And we're sponsored by Pandio, and we're going to make some connections for you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Have a great day and stay safe. Same. Bye, everyone.